Dear Ty, dear beloved community, it's so wonderful to be here with you. I had uh, many things going on, and Sister Chong Kong said, you must come, so here I am. I came. I always listen to Sister Chong Kong. <laughs> so my name is Sherry Maples, and I was a police officer seven years into my career when I ended up you can decide by accident or coincidence or a series of causes and conditions that came together at my first retreat with Ty. Before, I have noticed with many police officers, three things start to happen over the course of the career, their career, and that had already happened to me. And the effects of a career, there are three of them. Physiologically, what happens, and may, many of you might be able to relate to this if you live very busy lives. So research has showed that we all have a certain amount of adrenaline, and this is, this is the normal range of adrenaline, people that know how to be and rather than do probably are here and, and, and here. Uh, what happens with, with police officers, and you can probably relate to this with multitasking and doing too, is the adrenaline starts to shoot up because of hypervigilance and being worried about your own safety and the safety of everybody else. You're always taught about what can go wrong. Uh, not so much about what can go right, which is the majority of the time, but what can go wrong. So there's a lot of hypervigilance. So the adrenaline shoots out of the normal area and looks like a peak like that, and it takes 24 hours for it to come back into the normal range. But what happens is people go back to work before that 24 hours is up. So their lives start to look like this. In, if I had to just show it visually. So up here, people are you know, very making command decisions on their feet. They have a sense of humor. The adrenaline is kicked in. And then down here, which, where they start to spend their lives at home, this looks a lot like listlessness. Uh, there, no energy, listlessness, depression. A lot of the uh, symbols symbolic stuff that happens down here mimics depression really well. And as Sister Chong Kong said, uh, there are four times as many police officers in the United States anyway that take their own lives uh, as compared to the number that are killed in the line of duty. So this is a very real phenomenon. So physiologi physiologically, there are... Um, many effects that are very difficult. So that's, that's the first area. And emotionally, what begins to happen is the effects manifest as irritation and impatience and anger and depression. There's a lot of cynicism because now if you were all a group of police officers and I did a word association test and if I asked you, what's the first word that comes to your mind when you hear the word Boy Scout leader, I guarantee you they would all scream out in one, with one set word, pedophile. Because that, those are the Boy Scout leaders that they deal with. So there's a very cynical sort of response that, that develops. And spiritually, the effects, I think, of doing that job manifest as an armoring and a numbing of the heart. And it's very hard to be compassionate when those things are going on. So the other thing that, that happens is you develop what I call I used to syndrome. I used to know how to water the seeds of joy. I used to bike. I used to play sports. 
I used to garden. I used to write poetry. Um, I used to have hobbies. All those things are gone. And your world becomes smaller and smaller because of shift work and odd hours and thinking that people don't understand. You end up socializing and being only with other police officers. So all those things get reinforced. So that's how I showed up at my very first retreat with Ty in 1991. Um, I had a work injury and I was going to see a chiropractor. And this chiropractor was very close to where I reported for work. And she had a book of ties in the waiting room. It was called Being Peace. And I picked it up, and I was leafing through it. And I went, hmm, this is very interesting. And then I was ordered off work for a little while, and I saw a flyer on her bulletin board for a retreat that Thich Nhat Hanh was doing in Mundelein, Illinois in 1991. So I thought, well, I will give it a try. And I came very armored and defended, very, I was really ready for people to hate me because I was a police officer. Uh, I, 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 it, that happens a lot, even among people whose politics I, and progressive politics I share, they'd see the uniform and immediately uh, make a, a decision about who I was. So <laughs> that's the, the attitude I, I came there with. And what happened, I have to show, there, this is very interesting what happened. If you imagine, We did. Then things, the retreats were pretty quiet. Um, and we, we did, Thai taught just about everything. We did sitting meditation, we taught, we did eating meditation, we did walking meditation. There weren't nearly as many monastics then as there are now. Sister Chong Kong was there and, uh, you know, so many of the monastics have had such a huge impact on my life. What do you see there? Anybody? A red dot. Well, that's where I was living. And what, what, what I think meditation and mindfulness is about is it helps you see the white space, right? All this spaciousness. All this spaciousness that's available, and we go right to the red dot. So, you know, here we are with all this spaciousness available to us, and we hang on so tight to our little red dots, our thoughts and our emotions. And, uh, you know, out here, love is available. Happiness is available. No coming, no going is available. Emptiness is available. The spaciousness of being in everything and nothing at one time. That's how, even after that first retreat, I started to understand some of that intuitively. I hadn't read a lot. Uh, all I wanted to do was practice. And I th began to think of meditation as just resting my mind in this, with this open awareness. And at that retreat, I, I touched peace in a, in a really fabulous way. It, many strange things happened after that retreat. I came back. And I was working nights as a sergeant then. And I was going on calls, and I couldn't understand why everybody around me had changed, you know? <laughs> I, they seemed to have gotten kinder in my absence, uh, even people I was arresting. They, uh, <laughs> it didn't make any sense to me. I didn't know if somebody had gone around and sprayed Prozac or some other antidepressant while I was gone. but. It took me a little while to get that it was, my energy was different. 
and people were responding to it. That was an incredible teaching for me um, because there it was, the, the proof in the pudding. And so at that retreat also what happened, and Sister Chong Kong re referred to it, is this whole thing about the five mindfulness trainings came up. And of course the first one is reverence for life. And I said, I can't take these. I carry a gun for a living. I never know what's going to happen. And to this day, I can't remember if it was Thai or Sister Chung Kong. One of them said to me, who else would we want to carry a gun except somebody who will do it mindfully? <laughs> oh, a whole new way to look at things. So what happened for me was such a... a a transition where it took a while, the changes were incremental, but I stopped doing my job in a mechanical way. And what I started to see is what was right in front of me that I seemed to have missed with the other attitude, a suffering human being who needed my help and often didn't have any place else to turn to. So I started taking my time on the calls I went on. I started trying to connect with people from a different sp space. And I had these experiences early on. One of my favorites that I like to tell is uh, the experience of going on a domestic violence call. And we had a mandatory arrest policy in those days. So if anybody was threatening somebody or in a physical way, in any way whatsoever, you were supposed to arrest them. That was a mandatory arrest. So I went on this call and I didn't have any backup. And the woman came running out and said, my husband has my child and I'm really scared. We just broke up and I, he won't let her out to come be with me, I'm picking her up, we have an agreement about who's supposed to have the child. When and now it's my turn. So I asked her to go wait in the car down the block and I went and I knocked on the door and this, I'm about 5'3", and this 6'3", six, 6'4", six, inch man who looked very angry opened the door. And I could just see the suffering. It was just so obvious to me. And in a very calm voice, I said, may I come in? Uh, I'm just here to listen and to help. And I came in, and I saw his daughter over there. And I said, you know what? I, I see your little girl over here, and I know you love her, and I know how much you care about her, and I see that she's scared. And I know you don't want that to happen. So how about if we let her go out and be with her mother and you and I talk? And he did. And so rather than escalating this situation to the point where an arrest had to be made, it was just a matter of being compassionate and mindful. So I violated every policy in the book and with my gun belt and my, my uh, vest, my bulletproof vest, I sat down next to this guy, which you're never supposed to do on the couch, and he started crying in my arms. And um, that was an incredible experience for me in terms of what a little kindness and compassion can do and that there are alternative ways to respond to people. And of course, when you're angry and irritated and cynical yourself, it's really hard to, to see those possibilities. So I ran into this man three days later. I'm walking down the street that I lived on, and he came up behind me. And you know, it's not good to come up behind a police officer. <laughs> and picked me up off the ground, and he said, you, you, you saved my life that night. And uh, <laughs> he picked me right up and, and said that. So, so it was, uh, it was a wonderful experience. So I started, two of the teachings of ties and, and the order of interbeing in this, our community, our international community, 
that I think are so important is we focus, there's such an emphasis, not only on happiness in the present moment and having a foundational mindfulness practice, but building community and engaged practice. Those two things you don't find in too many other, the emphasis on that in too many other Buddhist traditions. And I've heard teachings from a lot of different traditions now, and those two things uh, are just so special. And I started thinking of Sangha community. I joined the Sangha right after that retreat, but I started thinking of community as wherever I was. I started thinking of my workplace as a Sangha. I started thinking of my family as a Sangha. When I did direct action things in the community, I started thinking of all of us as a Sangha. And so I think community is such a big piece of this. In 2002, I came to Plum Village. So we, 11 years has passed now, and I've been practicing. And uh, the practice is getting deeper and deeper and going on retreats. And I became a member of the, the Order of Interbeing. Thai transmitted the 14 mindfulness trainings to myself and 32 other people. And I was here for the, the three-month retreat and had such an incredibly grounding time. And you have to, in those days, you wrote a letter to, to Thai. I think you still write a letter if you, you want to be ordained. And I... I didn't think that he read these, so I just put it in the bell. And um, my letter was really about, I was still struggling with feeling like both a victim and an oppressor in this job um, and bouncing back and forth between, between those. And the next day there was a Dharma talk, and I can't remember which hall it was in, but Ty gave a Dharma talk on the different faces of love. And I was sitting in the back, and he mentioned uh, police officers. And I was sitting in the back, and I just had tears streaming down my face. Uh, and so another big transition took place then, more softness, more understanding of Ty's teaching about um, we're all victims and oppressors. You know. And one of the things that happened, and the ripple effects of this, I don't even know who it was, and she will never know the ripple effects of it. If you're here, please come tell me. We were doing working meditation and chopping vegetables, and I said, I have this very, very ridiculous image in my head of police officers holding hands and doing walking meditation together, creating peaceful steps on the earth. And she looked at me and she said, Sherry, you can make that happen. You can make that happen. So Thursday there was a question and answer session. And I got up and I asked Ty if he would come do a retreat for police officers. And I'm very worried about what the response will be. And he, much to my happiness and the opposite of that, he's looked up and he said, Yes, I think we do it next year. <laughs> Which meant there was a year to organize things and try to get police officers to come to a mindfulness retreat with a <laughs> Buddhist teacher. So there were many things that happened during the course of that year. Uh, but one of the... the I don't even have time to go into them. They were quite, um, it, was, it was very, very hard. There was a big reaction um, all over. I started getting hate emails uh, in terms of, I'm Christian and I want to offer a stress reduction retreat. Um, it, uh, separation of church and state, even though it was going to be a non-sectarian retreat, came up and it, it was... It was very challenging uh, that I had wonderful people in my own sangha and uh, uh, contact people in the, uh, among the monastics that uh, helped a lot. So Ty came, and we made this happen, and there were, there were 
I don't remember how many people there. There were about 16 officers from my own police department that were there. And after Ty's first Dharma talk, which was violence begets violence, uh, and um, talking about how, uh, you know, if you have a violent, if you put out violence, you're going to get violence pretty soon. And the police officers, after that first talk, surrounded me and they were like, Jerry, what are we supposed to do? What do you mean you can't fight violence with violence? What does he mean by that? What are we supposed to do? We want to talk to him. <laughs> and I said, well, I've never had a personal talk myself with Tiet Nhat Han, but I will see what I can do. So, another long story short, Ty came and talked to just the police officers. And by the end of that hour that he spent with them, the whole room went. It was just so beautiful. And after that, there was never, there was never another a problem uh, or objection that entire week. And one of the things that so affected me at the end of that retreat is Ty said, are we going to hear from the police officers? And so the Thursday night before the retreat ended, the police officers gave a presentation. And I have never heard police officers share like that, share what, what life is like for them as a police officer. And never before have I seen a community be so receptive to what they had to say. And that was so, I could just see them lighting up and it was just so meaningful that there were people who were willing to be receptive to this. And at the end of that retreat, the 16 officers from my department and I held hands, and did walking meditation. <laughs> so you never know what the ripple effects of anything can be. It, it was, and then all kinds of things happened once I got back to Madison out on the street. So one of the things that happened, this is a story that I just love, is one of the people who was at the retreat came up to me and said, Sherry. I just saw two of your officers, two of your young officers who were at the retreat, and they were arresting somebody, and they recognized me. They arrested the person, and they put them in the back of the car, and they turned to me, and they bowed. And so I said, well, when we bow to the person that we're arresting, as well as to the community that we're doing it for, we will really have arrived. <laughs> and uh, so it, there were miracles that, that happened. And then uh, in 2007, I went to Vietnam. Uh, probably many of you were there also, a big group of Westerners. and. Um, with the Thai and the monastic community, and that had a big impact on me. And um, toward the end of that, Sister Chong Kong delivered the message to me that Thai wanted to make me a Dharma teacher, transmit the lamp to me. And uh, it was okay. So in 2008, uh, that transmission of the lamp happened. And this is the gatha, my gatha for Thai, that I'd like to share with you. That you know, we always Thai and uh, the person always exchange gathas. Breathing in, I know that mindfulness is the path to peace. Breathing out, I know that peace is the path to mindfulness. Breathing in, I know that peace is the path to justice. Breathing out, I know that justice is the path to peace. Breathing in, I know my duty is to provide safety and protection to all beings. 
breathing out, I am humbled and honored by my duty as a peace officer. Breathing in, I choose mindfulness as my armor and compassion as my weapon. Breathing out, I aspire to bring love and understanding to all I serve. So that was, was really um, a, a wonderful, um, thank you. Um, thank you as the Sangha that, that holds all of us. There are three interrelated areas that I found my own personal work happening in over the course of the years that the practice got deeper and deeper for me. And that was my own inner work, my own meditation and mindfulness practice, which is, of course, the foundation for everything. And the second area was relationships. Uh, and the third area was engaged practice. And there is a an African-American man in the United States by the name of Cornell West, who said the epitome of how I think we should view policing. And he said, justice is what love looks like in public. Justice is what love looks like in public. How different would our system look if we adopted this definition of justice as the foundation for our whole system. It would just be incredible. You know, one of the things that the Buddha was so good at is providing the architecture for our distress and also providing the architecture for our liberation. And Thai was so wonderful at, at conveying the Buddhist teachings in such a simple way that could be understood. And one of the things that, that happened for me can probably be described, how Thai describes it, is the psychology of mindfulness. So in the psychology of mindfulness, there are two things that we're asked to be. One is a good curator of the museum of our past, and the other is a good gardener of our store consciousness. So if we're a good curator of the museum of our past, it means that we can reframe our past, we can understand it in the service of our own freedom. Now, if we carry it too far and we don't balance it with the other, we get attached to a wounded self because then we're constantly just taking tickets, bus tickets back to our past and we get attached to a wounded self. Over here, we're learning how to be a good gardener. We're learning what to incline our mind toward. We're learning that we can incline our mind toward, our hearts toward, and water the seeds of joy and kindness and understanding and compassion. But in order to be able to do this, we have to understand how our experience is born moment to moment. So if we can start to recognize, start to watch what arises, and notice how our experience is born moment to moment, if we can do that, we can also make conscious decisions about how to incline the heart and mind. And that is it's the, probably the most powerful thing that has happened to me over the years of this practice, is I can't tell you how many people come up to me and say, Sherry, you've gotten so much softer. And I guess it's true. You know, those protective layerings of armor get removed one at a time. You learn about craving and aversion and how to work with, with both of them. And one of the ways that I noticed about myself, a very subtle form of craving that I really wanted to heal was this craving to become. This craving to become with all of the achievements that go along with it and blah, 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 blah. All the doing that goes along with that, all the identity that gets created. So you build up this identity just to learn that you have to strip it down, right? Because so much of this practice is about disillusion of the the ego. And 
Unfortunately, in our society, success often gets equated with doing. And one of the things that I love about what Ty has helped me understand is that the quality of your doing will always be dependent on the quality of your being. And in order to really make that manifest, it requires a certain discipline in that you cannot let the things that matter the most be at the mercy of the things that matter the, less, the least. So often we think, if I'm just going to get this done, I'll just get this done, I'll just get this done, and then I'll focus on my practice. And then we become habitual waiters, right? We become habitual waiters. We become addicted to doing. And we have so many exhausted people running around that are addicted to doing. And as a result, in my culture anyway, we have a lot of people who are tired and wired, which leads to a lot of contentious behavior. Understanding is so key to this practice. I want to tell you a, a, a little story uh, that when I think back on it makes me smile so much. It was my first week of being a police officer, a rookie police officer on the, on the street. And we had just come off all of our experiences with our field training officers. And we're now riding alone. And so one of the first things that happened to me is the lieutenant of my shift, I mean, we have these briefing sessions before every shift starts, said to me, Maples, there's a homeless guy down there in the basement where our squad cars are and where our uh, evidence room is, and I want you to go down there and get him out of there. And I say, and skip briefing to do it. And I say, okay. So I go down there. And I make contact with this man who proceeds to tell me he doesn't have to go anywhere because he's the president of the United States. <laughs> so rather than understanding him and trying to put myself in his position, I say, I'm arguing with him that he's not the president of the United <laughs> States. And I'm getting more and more nervous because I know all these veteran police officers are gonna be coming down the stairs and that I'm failing at my very first assignment, right? And so this is not going well. And uh, finally, one of the veteran officers walks down, and he says, hey, rookie, let me show you how it's done. So he goes and he gets a key to the squad closest to where this homeless man is standing. And he opens the back door, and he says, Mr. President, your limo awaits you. And the guy gets right in, and off they go. <laughs> so that also taught me something about working for social change. Um, you know, one of the things that I think is, is really important is that we have to learn the difference between self-esteem and self-compassion. Because until we learn how to bring true self-compassion to ourselves, the practice doesn't really work well with other people. And when I say self-esteem, I mean, we used to have a lot of, and we still do, new age spirituality stuff in our bookstores that's all about self-improvement, right? You can make a full-time job out of self-improvement, which leads to high self-esteem. And I guess it's better than low self-esteem, but the problem with high self-esteem is you're still comparing yourself to other people. 
And in fact, sometimes you're competing with them and secretly hoping they do worse than you do. And it's not a very good way to, to live a, a spiritual life. Um, so it, with self-compassion, we're learning how to not just bring empathy to ourselves, but goodwill to ourselves in a phenomenal way. And one of the things that I've noticed is when I'm able to do that with the tools in the practice that the volume of me goes way down. And I'm happiest when the volume of me is lowest. And when the volume of me goes up, I start getting ready and all those habit seeds are ready to spring into to action. I wish I had um, more time, but I know you've been sitting here for a while, and I think I want to go directly to, I do want to read a quote by Thomas Merton, and then I want to tell you about the five things that I think need to happen in the policing profession. So, it's okay? So Thomas Merton said this, and this is, to me, it's such a, the epitome of Thai's teachings. To allow ourselves to be carried away by a multitude of conflicting concerns. To surrender to too many demands. To commit oneself to too many projects. To want to help everyone in everything is to succumb to violence. The frenzy of our activism neutralizes our work for peace. It destroys our own inner capacity for, pre for peace. It destroys the fruitfulness of our own work because it kills the root of inner wisdom, which makes work fruitful. One of the things I want to say, and I've done a lot of engaged work, we have uh, prison projects in Wisconsin now that went from being in one prison to being in the entire system. And I'm now happy to say that we are about to be able to start teaching mindfulness to the guards. Uh, we've been in um, doing uh, segregation, and uh, people have noticed the culture is changing, and with all the scientific research that's out there on mindfulness now, they are now asking us to bring it not just to the correctional officers, but to probation and parole agents as well. So that that is huge. Um, and I'll tell you about a couple of uh, other little projects, but I want to say that it's so important to keep our, that's why we have 60 days of mindfulness as members of the order of inner being. It's so important to keep the energy of our practice alive. And I've heard this term that they use now called compassion fatigue. Any of you heard of that term, compassion fatigue, burnout? And to me, burnout is a sign that we're violating our own nature in some way. It's usually regarded as a result of trying to give too much, but I think it can result from trying to give what we don't have. And this is the ultimate in giving too little. And I think that's where compassion fatigue comes from. So when, when the gift that we give is an integral and valued part of our own journey, when it comes from the organic reality of inner work, it's going to renew itself and be limitless in nature. But that means we have to keep our practice very strong and very alive. With respect to relationships, I, I just want to say that, uh, you know, to me, relationships are the litmus test of spirituality. And if our practice doesn't show up in our relationships, then something is, is wrong. And the single, from a practice perspective, probably the single most important thing and resource that I developed over time in my own practice, especially as a cop who carried a gun on a daily basis, is I started to experience the incredible healing power of non-aggression. And so what I learned to bring to any interaction was the intention not 
to cause more harm. And that included those times when I had to use force. But that intention was always there. And one of the other things that Ty taught me that was so valuable is that compassion can be gentle and compassion can be fierce. And wisdom is knowing when to employ the gentle compassion of understanding or the fierce compassion of good boundaries. And that is, is very important. And I think how we talk and relate to others is probably the most important piece work that we can engage in. I, I remember at work when uh, I was captain of personnel and training, and one of the great things is I was then in charge of training the whole department, and so could get some really good things done. But I remember sitting at my computer working on this academy, uh, the curriculum for the academy, when one of my young officers came in and said, Captain, can I please talk to you? And in, internally I went, oh, because I didn't want to interrupt what was happening. I had to get this done. And that was such a lesson to me. I immediately recognized what was happening and made a commitment that I was going to switch the foreground and the background, that relationships were going to be more important to me than tasks. And that meant managing a to-do list, and it meant some people would be upset. It meant that I didn't get as many things done as I did before. But what could be more important than giving my presence to another human being? Because the ripple effects of that, you can never, never know. Well, there were so many other things, but I'm going to, I do want to talk to you about the current criminal justice system and what I think needs to change in it. And I don't, I can't speak um, for what's going on in Europe or uh, Vietnam or Thailand or other countries, but I can speak from what's going on in the United States. And that is that our current criminal justice system is based on this very faulty premise. And that premise is that the punishment of the perpetrator is going to heal the victim and rehabilitate the perpetrator. And what I found is that neither one of those things are true. And that it seems to reflect a collective belief that contributes to all kinds of interpersonal and systemic dysfunction because what this premise fails to recognize is one of the basic premises of restorative justice and that is that it's not the wrongdoer's repentance that creates forgiveness, but it's the victim's forgiveness that creates repentance. And I've seen this happen over and over and over again. So what do we have to do to change the criminal justice system? Well, I've been focusing on five things. One is we need to recognize what working as a police officer does. And if you take soldiers or people that are on the SWAT teams, uh, or the ops teams in policing, the effects that I've talked about are, are much more intense. So we teach people how to keep themselves physically safe. We teach them how to keep themselves physically safe and others physically safe by using force and how to use force. But we don't teach them how to keep themselves emotionally safe. And that's where I receive such gift is with, of, of mindfulness from Thai. It's so important that we begin to provide criminal justice professionals with the training that will help them identify how their world works and how it can be uh, undone, and especially in the emotional realm. And it's important that we not just do stress reduction. The, the thing about mindfulness, and we know this from the trainees, is it brings a whole ethical framework. 
along with it that's really important not to leave behind. And what I do as, a, as somebody who is a police officer is I know how to translate that language into language they understand. Don't talk to them about Buddhism. Uh, but I, I, I know the language, I know the culture, and all of you know the same thing wherever you are. You know the language, you know the culture, we have to figure out how to translate it. So focusing on the emotional health of criminal justice professionals is very important. The second thing that is so important is we need to take seriously the conscious and unconscious biases that police officers and other criminal justice professionals are walking around with that leads to racial profiling and the incredible racial disparities throughout our system. And these unconscious biases show up not just in the obvious ways, not in the worst possible ways of deadly force, but they also show up in ways that with coworkers and people we interact with that build resentments and fuel divisions and threaten our own safety as well as the safety of others. So with respect to racial disparities, I think police officers can be trained to slow down the decision-making process. I used to watch young officers stop a car and I would say to them, okay, I want you to talk me through the reasons you made that stop and what was going on. And now I want you to talk me through where your reasonable suspicion was for having them get out of the car and search the car. I want you to talk me through the thought process that happened. And that usually is an opportunity for me to really um, make a difference. So when we're dealing with racism, and racial disparities, there are decision-making points in any organization that can be identified where race can be a factor. And there are hundreds of them in the criminal justice profession. But it's important, I think, that every single one of us identify those decision-making points in our own organizations and really sit down and think about them. So. With respect to discrimination and oppression in our collective lives, activists face many challenges. Um, for those of us who have experienced marginalization of some kind, it's how do we free ourselves from the adaptations that we've made to our oppression. And, and for those areas that we have unearned the unearned assets of privilege in, how do we cut through our sense of privilege in some areas of life, and our inferior status in others. How do we get over our superiority, inferiority, and equality complexes? The third thing that I think has to happen is coordinated community responses. We have to start taking seriously the proposition that public safety really depends on the capacity of neighborhoods and how to build the capacity of neighborhoods. And in terms of engaged Buddhism, we've come up with several different ways to do that. And I hope I get a chance to do a question and answer session at some point and, and tell you uh, about those. Um, and the fourth strategy is that we would put a lot more effort into reducing environmental opportunities for for crime, so we would gather more data to notice what the patterns really are and we would be proactive rather than reactive so that we don't keep responding to the same thing over and over. And rather than having officers tied to radio calls, go here, go there, they would be more connected to neighborhoods and technology and crime prevention resources. Um, so police officers have to really begin to understand that in order to be effective, they can't rely on their authority, uh, that they have to rely on so much more and that they have to rely on a much larger coordinated community effort. A fifth thing I, I want to address is that we should all be very, very concerned about the militarization of our police departments. 
the police mission is very, very different. A police mission is to serve and protect our neighbors, our friends, our community residents. And we don't do that by militarizing our departments and turning people into enemies. And I think that's where communities really come into being because it's pressure on police departments to change that makes all the difference in the world. And on the other hand, it's very, very important. The last thing I would say is that police officers need your support. They need your understanding. I've seen what happens when they get it. And they need to hear from you, and they need to understand you. So the more situations that we can put police officers and residents of communities in where they just have the opportunity for dialogue. I think that makes all the difference in the world. And the other thing I want to say to all of you, I don't know what cultures and organizations that you work in, but one of the things that I got committed to as a result of my own engaged Buddhism is noticing the unwritten and unconscious agreements that existed in the organization, in the culture of policing. So uh, those things aren't in the policy manual, but the things we get socialized to in any community can be identified. And once you identify those and you bring them into the conscious arena for discussion, more ethical behaviors just start to happen because people are examining and thinking about those behaviors. And so often in our associ associational lives, uh, especially in the organizations and communities we're part of, we tend to think of ourselves as effect rather than cause. Somebody else, the leader is responsible for this. Somebody else did this. Um, and we seem to believe that someone or something else is the problem and that someone needs to do something better for things to change and we forget that we're a member of this organization. So I, I will hear people come out of a meeting and say, oh, that was a terrible meeting and I say, were you there? <laughs> so it, it was a terrible meeting because we all made it a terrible meeting. So what could you have done to improve it? So in authentic community membership, we're always holding ourselves accountable for the well-being of the lar larger community. So we become more than just judging critics and consumers. And we sh start to shift the belief that this world, this organization, this meeting, this gathering is ours to construct together. And that's what has to happen. Any one of us can make such an important difference in any given moment. So you can be the person that makes the difference in a contentious interaction. You can be the person that because of your practice pauses and refrains and holds that grounding. And you can be the person that rather than exacerbating pain and violence transforms it by the way you bear witness to it. And you can be the person who instead of telling people how it should be, that you bring those unconscious and unskillful ways into the conscious arena of question and dialogue. And you can be the person who chooses not to gossip or to recruit others to your viewpoint behind closed doors in an organization. So let me just say in conclusion that probably the most radical political act that any of us will engage in is how to learn to live in more harmony with everyone and everything. So to change the world or to love everybody is too big an ambition for any single person. But to respond to this moment with engagement and compassion is possible for each and every one of us. And what Thich Nhat Hanh inspired in me was the strong belief that even something like carrying a gun for a living can be an act of love if one is also armed with mindfulness and a compassionate intent, intention. So thank you for your presence, your practice, and your attention.